and uh, that maybe I, I can start. So yeah, so in this talk, we will uh, I, I will talk a little bit about uh, some of our recent work on uh, uh, using deep machine learning and deep learning for uh, enabling bio systems to be on five G and in, in, in particular enabling scalability, uh, mobility, and uh, reliability. So this is a work done with my uh, PhD students, Mohammed uh, Arabian and Yu Zhang. Right, so starting with the motivation for uh, large scale MIMO for beyond 5G. So uh, in, in, in terms of communication, um, expected to, to continue basically uh, uh, using uh, low frequency massive MIMO systems and, and high frequency above 100 gigahertz using uh, uh, um, antenna arrays, large antenna arrays for in particular for beam forming, and also as a source of um, uh, as a kinds of large scale MIMO and cell free distributed massive MIMO and intelligent services. But the problem with large scale MIMO systems in communication uh, or, or large scale MIMO communication in general will have also several challenges in terms of mobility, how, how to support high mobility with all these uh, antennas and. Um, there are several challenges in terms of channel estimation overhead and, and, and beam forming, and also in terms of reliability, especially at higher frequency when these systems are very sensitive to, to blockage, uh, and uh, also in terms of energy efficiency, especially if we have large, large scale MIMO systems. So then one important question is how to enable scalable MIMO communication systems at, um, um, at, at whether beyond basically uh, uh, above 100 gigahertz or even at low frequency, let's say intelligent services and, and massive memory systems. The other sort uh, or other applications also of, um, of large scale MIMO systems um, will appear in sensing and imaging. So, if we especially at higher frequency uh, and with the advantage of the large bandwidths and the small wavelengths, so it, um, all these basically points give um, a lot of advantages for um, sensing and imaging, electromagnetic imaging and also for positioning. So then an important uh, point will be, uh, how, how can we leverage minor communication systems for sensing and positioning, and also how to leverage all the sensing and positioning information to maybe help uh, large scale minor communication systems. Uh, so in particular, uh, if, we, if we focus on, on communication systems, so there are three main directions that um, at least we, we focus on, and those are also more. And so one important uh, point is, um, one important direction that we consider is how to predict this large scale MIMO uh, systems and beams uh, and a large number of beams. And in, in particular, we uh, will talk about this concept of channel mapping, which could be a basis of, um, uh, of, of, um, of establishing this kind of general theory for predicting large scale MIMO systems or channels. Another important direction is to um, uh, to, to how to learn beamforming code books, and since many of these systems rely on beamforming code books for initial access and data transmission. So how can we learn beamforming code books that adapt to the environment and the hardware? And another direction um, relates to the last point I mentioned, which is basically if we have a lot of sensing information from uh, whether electromagnetic imaging or sensing or positioning, then how can we leverage all this information for uh, millimeter wave and terahertz? So in this talk, I will focus on the first two points particular channel mapping and the informing Google. Uh, so first for channel mapping, um, the, the motivation for channel mapping um, starts with, uh, with also the challenges that, um, that face uh, large scale MIMO systems and particular mobility and uh, reliability or robustness challenges. So whether we are talking about, milli about millimeter wave systems, so with, with, with mobility then uh, finding the best beam uh, there requires large training overhead, and also it has a lot of challenges for, uh, or these systems have a lot of challenges for reliability. Or if we talk about FDD massive MIMO systems and with, with some mobilities, uh, also that uh, Im impose a lot of challenges on the, on the robustness and the amount of training and feedback of the channels. Uh, so if we, if we look at in, in, a, in an abstract way about all these problems, then uh, we can say that the key challenge is the large channel acquisition overhead. Because uh, if we can quickly estimate that channel, um, then we can predict the beam quickly and can maybe predict the blockage also, uh, or at least the state, and then switch to another beam or another base station. So then how can machine learning help? Um, the general intuition or the general motivation um, when we started here is that 
if we look at the channels, I mean, we're talking about the channels require large training overhead, but then if we, if we look at the channels, then uh, we can generally say that the channels are defined by the various elements of the, of the environment. This includes channel geometry, transmitter receiver locations, uh, building materials, et cetera. So in, in again, an abstract way, may write the channel vector or matrix or beamforming vector as a function of the different elements of the environment. Uh, but then the, the challenge, of course, is that this is hard to characterize analytically and it's different from location to location. Um, and here, maybe machine learning models can help. So we can think of machine learning or, or think of this function in, in terms of machine learning model as, uh, as a model that will, uh, will have all these inputs, environment, geometry, materials, locations. And then the objective of this machine learning model is to predict that channel, uh, again, the channel, when I say the channel, I mean, the vector matrix or, or a beam forming or channel covariance so some function of the channel. Now, if the trick here is that if we can train this machine learning model uh, to, to, learn, to, to be really able to, to map this environment geometry materials that are to the channels, and if we can find some uh, um, uh, efficient features that encode these inputs, environment geometry materials and locations, uh, such that these features can be acquired with low training overhead, then from these features that I think can be, can be required with low training overhead, we can predict directly the channels or, vic or beam forming vectors that may need large training overhead. So this is uh, the motivation uh, behind basically the general idea. And then the next question then is, uh, what are these features? And what are these not features that could represent uh, all these inputs in, in a way that, uh, in, in such a way that they are also can be uh, um, quickly acquired uh, or acquired with low training overhead? So in um, looking at these features, basically we're looking for these features. Uh, so we developed this concept of channel mapping in space and frequency. And uh, uh, the general uh, idea here in channel mapping is that if we consider a static environment with two sets of antennas, M1 and M2, that could be generally at two different locations in the same environment, of course, and two different frequency bands. And then, if we uh, if we if these two sets of antennas uh, are serving the same basically user, that again can take a certain set of locations in this environment, then we can define uh, two mapping functions from the position to the first set of antenna, and from the position uh, sorry from the position to the, the channels of the first set of antenna, and from the position to the channels of the first of the second set of antennas. Uh, so these mapping uh, functions exist. Uh, in general, by, by construction. Now, the, uh, the, the condition here, or the, that uh, we will uh, basically stress on, is that if, the, uh, if we can further show that, or prove that the, uh, the mapping function from the positions to the first set of antenna, or the chance of the first set of antenna is bijective, meaning that every position will have a different channel at the first set of antenna, then this means that the inverse exists. And this means that the composite mapping from the channel to the position to the channel as the first as second set of antenna exists. And or basically that we can map directly the channels from the first set of antenna to the channels at the second set of antenna. Again, I'm assuming so far static environment. I, I, will, I will go back like in a, in, a, in a few basically slides and discuss all these kind of uh, constraints. But, uh, but so far, assuming static environment, and if we can show that this condition is bijective, then uh, there exists mapping from uh, the channel at the first set of antenna to the channels at the second set of antenna. And if this mapping exists, then the, 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 the interesting point here is that using the, uh, the general approximation theory and in, in, in neural networks, then, then there exists a complex enough neural networks that can learn this mapping as, as, as long as uh, it exists. And this is very interesting because it means that if we know the channel at the first set of antenna, which could probably be at a slightly different location or a different frequency band, then we can use it to predict the channel at the second set of antenna. And uh, one important note not here is that, um, that we didn't put any constraint on the number of antennas at the second set or the number of antennas at the first set. So the only condition is that we need this uh, bijectiveness uh, condition to be satisfied. Um, and once it is satisfied, then we can map, let's say, four or eight antennas at one frequency band to maybe 100 antennas at another frequency band. 
Uh, and in practice, so if we now look at this bijectiveness condition, so this bijectiveness conditions, in fact, is uh, the same conditions that um, that we need, let's say, in fingerprinting and positioning, because it, it essentially means that if we know the channel at the first set of antennas, then we can use this channel to distinguish between two positions. Uh, so it, it is, it's actually a condition that is already uh, implicitly uh, assumed, I would say, in, in, in the literature of fingerprinting. And, um, and the other th thing is that if, if we look at the first set of uh, the channel, the first set of antennas, complex basically vectors, then how many antennas uh, would, uh, would we need to, to, to be able uh, to, to achieve basically this bijectiveness condition to have two different complex channels for, every, for any two different locations? It may not be hard to uh, basically um, validate this condition if we have, let's say, four or eight antennas. Uh, of course, this depends on the number of antennas, the distribution of the antennas, um, the number of scatters in the environment, and the number of possible location setters. So this is um, this what will decide whether or not this bijectiveness condition is satisfied. But then the, the key point here is that once it's satisfied, we have this uh, mapping function. And in practice, also is uh, we discussed also actually in another paper in practice in, 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 the, in terms of fingerprinting that this bijectiveness condition in, in, in is, is satisfied in many practical wireless communication scenarios. Uh, now, if this again bijectiveness condition is satisfied and we have this mapping, then this is uh, this can lead to a lot of interesting applications. So, if we look at let's say uh, so, now several special cases of this mapping uh, concept is that if we uh, let's say focus on mapping in frequency meaning that let's say the two uh, the two antenna sets uh, coexist so there's just one antenna set but then they are two different frequency bands uh, let's say one is at uh, uplink and one is at downlink um, then and this could uh, this means that if we know the uplink channel is at fdd mass of mimo system we can use this uh, channel to predict the downlink channel at mass of mimo system well, uplink channel can be easily uh, estimated with one or a few pilots but then the downlink channels are normally uh, hard to, to predict because it needs, it needs uh, training of a lot of antennas and then feedback also of all these channels. Or also this means that if we know the channel at the sub-6 uh, gigahertz, then we can actually use this channel to predict the millimeter wave, uh, maybe channel or a millimeter wave beam. Um, so this could be also interesting because it's, it's easy to estimate the channel at low frequency uh, with a few antennas, but it's hard to predict the channel or beam at, at high frequency with, with lots of antennas. Now, again, here we, we assume that the uh, bijectiveness, like if we also consider sub six millimeter waves, so we assume implicitly that the bijectiveness condition will be satisfied at zero frequency. Uh, or if we look at the channel mapping in space, so this means that, and again, in the context of FDD massive MIMO, if we know the channel, uh, let's say in the downlink at a few antennas, then we can map this channel to the channels at, uh, at all the other antennas. As long as that the, ch that the channel, uh, that the position to that channel, to this few element uh, channel at at um, at the downlink is bijected, meaning that every two positions again will lead to two different uh, channel vectors, just for these few uh, elements. So this can mean essentially that we don't need, let's say, to train and feedback all the antennas in the downlink. Maybe we need to train and feedback only a few antennas, and then use this to uh, use this deep neural network to uh, reconstruct the channel at other uh, antennas. Or also in cell-free massive MIMO or distributed massive MIMO, this means that probably we don't need to to feedback or to feed uh, for all feedback actually all the all the antennas from all the distributed terminals to the central crossing unit. Maybe we need to feed only a few uh, antennas with a chance at a few antennas. Okay, now uh, this bijectiveness condition. I just read some remarks on on this mapping concept so far. Uh, the bijectiveness condition, as I mentioned, is is also required for fingerprinting, and uh, so this paper also provides some uh, validation or or some discussion on the practicality of this concept actually from fingerprinting again perspective, which is kind of the same that we also implicitly assume here. Um, so it's satisfied with high probability in in, in practical communication scenarios with a few antennas. And uh, again, also like that, uh, whether or not it is, uh, uh, it is, it is um, satisfied depends on the number of antennas, the array geometry, the number of multipasses, etc. Um, now this mapping concept so far, we assume that we have a static environment and that, uh, and we don't, we didn't put really any constraint on or assumptions on the frequency of the space. 
So another important question is, is it, is it practical to predict the channels, exactly the channel, the complex channels in a different frequency or space in realistic environments? Um, uh, so this may not be really very practical for several reasons. First, I mean, to really predict the channel complex uh, vector or matrix, first, uh, predicting the exact complex uh, vector with neural network may not be accurate in general. Um, and uh, especially if we have some uh, dynamics in the environment, so basically the channels would change and predicting the, exactly the, the, the exact channel uh, vector, uh, the complex vector may not be accurate. The other thing is that this normally is this implicitly assumes that we, I mean, uh, to tra train this neural network uh, to learn this mapping, this, this assumes that we collected a lot of data set or a large data set uh, in this particular static environment. So if we have, let's say, dynamics, this assumes again that for every scene, we will collect large enough uh, data set to train the neural network to learn this mapping. So which is not maybe uh, very practical because the environment changes and, and so on. But we can still build on, on this uh, channel mapping in towards more robust, uh, uh, basically, model, which what we call statistical channel prediction. So in, in statistical channel prediction, essentially, instead of predicting the channel, exactly the channel complex vector, we predict the channel subspace. Uh, so, uh, and, and this builds on, on the same exact, uh, basically, motivation of, of, of the channel mapping. So if we, if we have, let's say, environment and we have users, so you can think of, of this uh, user uh, set as a, or, or the positions of the, of the users as basically clusters. So if we know the, 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 the subspace, the channel or, or a few channels so that construct basically channel subspace or channel dominant basically vectors of the channel uh, um, uh, covariance matrix of a certain cluster at the first set of antenna, then we can probably or, or potentially map this uh, um, information to the channel subspace at the second set of antenna. And if we can do that, then if we know the channel subspace or the dominant channel subspace, then we can use it to uh, um, to reduce, to massively reduce the dimensions of the channel estimation. So we can maybe need just a few uh, pilots over the air whose classical training to estimate the actual channel. So and essentially what we are trying to do here is to predict the conditional uh, downlink channel covariance. So it's conditioned on the position of this user implicitly. So we don't uh, uh, explicitly estimate the position. So we just look at the channel at one frequency band or one, uh, one space uh, set of antenna at one frequency band in one space, but then implicitly this assumes that uh, um, that we go through basically the channel cluster to predict the, down, the downlink, uh, the conditional downlink channel covariance at another another set of antenna. Um, so this is, uh, I think this is, is much more practical because here we we, we rely on, on machine learning in your network just to predict uh, the, the, the subspace of the channel. Uh, so it's more like statistical information. And then we rely on over the air training to 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 to, to refine and predict the actual channel, uh, which makes it more robust. Uh, so we leverage uh, also machine learning to reduce the number of pilots from maybe 64 antenna or 64 pilots to uh, maybe a few pilots. Um, uh, and in the same time, we gain also robustness. So this is kind of compromise between the two uh, the, the two directions. Now, two important two quick applications of of this ch uh, covariance channel prediction. Uh, first, an FDD massive MIMO. So here we considered uh, uh, a dynamic scenario. So we have a, a street with two base stations and we have a grid of users. And these vehicles basically they move and they are within basically the, the line of sight path of the, of the channel. So they continuously uh, uh, distract the, uh, or, or, or abstract basically the, the line of sight direction. So kind of to generate some dynamics in, in, in the channel. Um, and what we do here is that we assume that we get the uplink channel, one or more uh, pilots of the uplink channel at the first set of uh, antennas. And then we map this to the downlink channel at the second set of antenna. And then we try to see um, basically if we, uh, okay, sorry. So we, we map this to the downlink channel uh, subspace at the second set of antennas, so the dominant uh, subspace so the dominant subspace could be three pilots, uh, three dominant uh, basically vectors of the channel subspace, or five, or seven, or nine, and then we use this uh, sub uh, the subspace of different dimensions to uh, refine and estimate the actual channel. And we see basically how much 
uh, gain or spectral efficiency we can achieve per user. So if we look at this uh, figure on the right, so we uh, we look at the per user spectral efficiency versus the number of users and um, uh, uh, in this multi-user uh, downlink beam uh, uh, precoding or transmission. So if we if we assume that we use the the channel the just the statistical the sorry the deterministic channel mapping uh, that I discussed earlier. Uh, that assumes that we, we map the channel directly to a channel vector, then this is uh, the performance that we get, this dashed uh, red line, uh, compared to this black uh, solid line, which is uh, uh, the per user uh, spectral efficiency if we, uh, if we have full uh, downlink channel knowledge. So this is basically our upper bound. And this other blue uh, curves represent the performance if we um, predict just the downlink channel subspace of different uh, dimensions, and then we use uh, classical training uh, conditions on this channel subspace to predict the actual channel, and then use this actual channels of this uh, number of users to design their precoding matrix. So this essentially shows that with with five or seven or nine pilots, we get very close to the uh, to the to the performance with full channel knowledge. So again, this is a compromise between relying on machine learning to uh, directly estimate the channel or um, relying on that to just give it uh, give us a subspace or reduce basically the number of pilots. And then we uh, we gain robustness by relying on actually uh, over the air training. Another application is in, in, in using sub six gearhurst to predict the millimeter wave uh, uh, beam. Uh, so millimeter wave beam training is challenging. It requires large training overhead. But then most of actually 5G and, and all these like uh, future standards, they will rely on uh, uh, dual band operation. So they will have sub six, uh, the base station and the UE will likely operate both at sub six and uh, sub six gigahertz and millimeter wave or about even 100 gigahertz. So then can we use the sub six channels to predict the millimeter wave beam? So there's been of course earlier work on, on using uh, sub six to sub six gigahertz channel information to, to, to let's say try to help in beam forming. And this earlier work mainly relied on estimating the channel parameters, but then estimating the channel parameters have a number of limitations. First, that this requires really that uh, um, uh, let's assume that we, uh, um, uh, if we don't know basically the distribution of these channel parameters, then normally going from the channel to the channel parameters uh, have several limitations, especially in, in, in terms of uh, of angle of arrival and, and delay, etc. And then the other uh, the other challenge is that uh, we may not really know the channel parameters at at sub six and millimeter wave, uh, which is uh, which is another uh, another limitation. So here, what we try to do is that we go directly from sub six gigahertz channel to the millimeter wave beam, relying on the neural network to learn this implicit basically mapping. Uh, and again, I mean this. Uh, if we uh, just following basically what we discussed in the channel mapping concept, so if we if we know the uh, the channel at a few antennas at let's say in the uplink uh, sub six gigahertz channel, um, here we assume let's say we have four antennas, then uh, then we can prove also that again building on what we discussed in the mapping theory that we can uh, um, distinguish. So here is more like a classification problem. If we know the sub six channel, can we can we uh, map this to which to 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 to, to tell us basically which beam? Is, uh, is the optimal beam in terms of uh, achievable rate or, or beam forming gain. Uh, and then if we can do that, then if this mapping exists, then we can um, use this, this mapping to predict which, uh, which beam to use. Um, so these are some results where we show that if we have, uh, if we just get the channel at uh, four antennas in uh, sub six gigahertz, and then we try to use this to predict the millimeter wave uh, beam, uh, assuming a different number of, of antennas at uh, at the millimeter wave. So at, at sub six, we have only four antennas. And these are the S, uh, SNR uh, ranges that we uh, that we estimate that the sub six gigahertz channel at. And then we, we use, again, this estimated sub six gigahertz channel to predict the millimeter wave beam at different number of elements. So, um, so is, if we have just four antennas at millimeter wave, so this is the performance of uh, top one um, beam prediction. So I, Again, if we have like top two or top three, then this is expected to improve. Um, and uh, yeah, all the way to basically 64. Beams. So if we look, look at, let's say, at, again, one, one other advantage is that we can estimate actual sub-six gigahertz channel at relatively good SNR. So if we, if we look at, let's say, five or 10 
dB as an R, then uh, we can achieve maybe 70% success probability in predicting the best beam out of 64 cooled block of beams at a millimeter wave system. Um, and yeah, again, this is expected to improve if we consider not just top one, but maybe top two and top three, and then we refine over there for the, uh, for, for the test, for the optimum. Um, all right. Um, so now I will move. Um, to the... Ahmed, I just had a question. Um, you know, obviously this is probably the harder problem going from sub six measurements to millimeter wave beam prediction, but you know, uh, really relevant for five G is even just you know, you have a say an FDD system, right? And um, you know, they've pretty much eliminated the usual, you know, the kind of code book based beam forming, right? For so you, let's, let's say you're at a you know just a normal carrier frequency like two gigahertz, and um, your FDD, I mean. You know, now the, the base station is trying to predict the best downlink beam former or, you know, uh, pre coding matrix um, in MIMO just based on very little FDD feedback. And they're trying to like essentially infer from the uplink transmissions what the downlink beam former should be, even though it's in a different band. Have you, have you looked at anything similar like to that? Because this seems like you could, you know, just thinking about this could be a kind of a powerful model for that, that problem too. Sorry. That was the last question. I oh, was just wondering if you'd looked at that in, in addition to the sub six to millimeter wave mapping, if you even look, just looked at doing this for FDD uh, in the same band. Yeah, so so uh, essentially what, uh, sorry. So, yeah, so, so essentially this is uh, what we were trying to do here. So if we, uh, uh, so in this first, basically application. So yeah, I mean, if we know the uplink channel, so we can potentially map this also to the downlink and this uplink could be just like in, a, in an X band, right? The adjacent band doesn't have to be at a completely different band. Um, so this is, uh, actually we have another paper where we try to build uh, a small, I say, proof concept prototype that validates this concept. I mean, just in a bit adjacent band. So let's say going from 2.4 gigahertz to 2.5. And we were able to get some, some promising results. And uh, I know that uh, Andy Mollish also like he has some, uh, some, uh, some, some, some experimental also effort in uh, going along the same direction of, uh, he has actually some results on, on just using uh, classical signal processing to let's say move some of the parameters at, again, going through the parameter pass. Like if we know the uplink channel, can we estimate maybe some parameters? And then if we know these parameters as angle of arrival, um, or, or delay, etc. Can we can we use these parameters to reconstruct the channel at the downlink? So uh, so even some 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 implementation or prototyping, I mean, shows that this is possible. Now, if we um, yeah, so so is this does this answer the question or yes yeah okay so, so yeah so so it is I, I think even the experimental results show that it's possible to move maybe just a, a few, I mean, let's say Andy Molish like results, I mean, it's maybe within 100 megahertz, uh, it is possible to actually map the uplink to downlink. Uh, our results also are within uh, maybe also 10, 10, 100 or 10 megahertz. And it's also, uh, uh, we showed that this is also possible, but I mean, as the results are more kind of, uh, I think uh, the setup is more interesting in terms of the hardware. Um, um, but actually what we are also trying to do now is to show that we can go from sub six to millimeter wave. And, and in fact, actually, if you, if you think of it, like going from sub six gigahertz channel to a millimeter wave beam, so this millimeter wave beam will, you can think of it as a covariance or subspace, right? it's channel subspace. It's not really a, just a channel vector. So it could be even an easier problem than going from uh, uplink FDD channel to, to the downlink channel. That's yeah, kind of I, 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 I was thinking that too, because you just really need to know the geometry of it, right? Whereas where the yeah. uplink to downlink at sub six, you need to know kind of all the local scattering and the, exactly. it's exactly. actually harder in that sense, yeah. It's exactly. A richer, it's a richer channel. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, All right, so for, for, for beam code book learning, so beam code books are, uh, are very important for millimeter wave operation and about maybe 100 gigahertz in the future. 
for uh, several reasons. First, that channel estimation is challenging at millimeter wave, which motivates that we just try to do beam training and find the best beam pair. And also the, 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 the hardware constraints that are imposed on the, on the RF front end and the, and the millimeter wave and the uh, systems will uh, also make it hard to, to really estimate the actual channel. And, um, and this again motivates using uh, beam forming code box. Uh, but then the classical beamforming code box have several limitations. First, they are not, they are typically predefined, not optimized for the specific deployment. Uh, so for example, the base station could have specific tilt angle and height and environment could have the specific geometry and users also could be distributed and or traffic of the users could be maybe focused on certain directions and certain angular uh, or, or elevation and azimuth. Uh, so just having basically a code box that scans all directions and all azimuth and elevation basically uh, possible directions, I mean, may not be uh, optimal and could lead to large training overhead. Uh, so we may need large beamforming uh, vectors and large, uh, large beam code book and which, which again um, will lead to large training overhead. And also this could, may not be optimized for, um, uh, for also the, the users, let's say that are non-line of sight. So these code books are normally single loop narrow beam uh, code books. And uh, if we have a user that's in the line of sight or, just, or, or a set of users that are typically in the line of sight, so maybe in that case, the best beam uh, could have, let's say, multiple loops. And the other point is that uh, these code books are also not typically optimized for specific hardware uh, or the array geometry. So the, and they may need a lot of calibration uh, before, after the fabrication to, to, to calibrate the antenna and the beams uh, for the specific hardware and all, with all its imperfections. So this could lead to high training overhead, low efficiency, and um, and without calibration, these beams could be corrupted, or with calibration, so the calibra calibration process is also expensive. So can we use machine learning to learn how to make these beams um, more optimized or uh, aware of the of the environment of the specific environment, uh, or to leverage basically some awareness about the environment and hardware? to make these beams uh, adapt to this, to the hardware user distribution and uh, environment geometry. Um, so here we will uh, we'll first consider some, um, focus on neural networks basically, and can, how can we build neural networks that can uh, adaptively learn these optimized beams. And then we move to uh, some recent results with, with uh, some, some recent work with uh, reinforcement learning. And the objective is essentially, again, to learn beams that adapt to the deployment, environment geometry, user distribution, and hardware and array geometry. So this could also maybe work in non-stationary channels or, 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 or scenarios with, with non-uniform or array geometry. And this could be uh, particularly important also for uh, new like uh, systems like intelligent services where we have maybe large, uh, large number of antennas distributed, and maybe some of these elements could be, could, may not be working as others. So the, it's very hard to calibrate these, these large array geometries and uh, these large array systems, and especially if they are distributed and and uh, and if they are like occupying also large uh, dimensions. So the, um, some of these basically uh, elements may have different visibility regions. Uh, okay, so um, considering this uh, simple system model where we have uh, analog only beam forming architecture. So this is important because we will focus on this architecture uh, and we'll try to, um, build our neural network actually to, to account for the hardware constraints that we have in this architecture. So analog only and this can potentially be extended to, to hybrid beamforming architectures. Um, so in that case, the, the, the beamforming vector is, is simply just uh, uh, the, the phase of, is defined by the phases or the phase shifts at different, different elements. And we assume for simplicity that the users have single antennas and, uh, and we consider a geometric channel model. So our objective is to maximize the beamforming gain. So if we, um, uh, which is essentially, if we have a code book, let's say W of a certain number of beams. So we try to find the beams that is, um, that maximizes the beamforming gain. And um, so if we look at just an optimization problem. So here, if we have a, a set of channels, so this is a data set of channels, uh, then our objective is to design a beamforming code box that maximizes uh, expectation of the beamforming gain over this uh, set of channels. And this needs to respect also the hardware constraint that is defined by the phase shifter um, and the analog beamforming architecture. 
So we need to design a, cool, uh, a neural network that accounts for, 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 for these uh, constraints. So now one observation first is that if we look at this analog only beam forming, so we, the output of the RF chain is essentially the, 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 the beam forming or the combining vector uh, W conjugate transpose H channel, which is uh, interestingly equivalent to the, the, the output of the neural, let's say of the third of, of just a single layer, uh, fully connected layer. So if we, uh, if we, if we have just a single fully connected layer uh, where the inputs are the channel elements, then the output is W conjugate transpose. Uh, I mean, we can we can make it uh, basically if we have the weights as W the, the conjugate of the, of, of the of the weights, then we get W conjugate transpose H. So that's interesting because it means that if we have complex uh, fully connected uh, layer, just a single layer, then we can essentially uh, as, uh, consider the, the weights of this neural network directly as the beam forming weights. So if we optimize these weights of the neural network, so we are directly optimizing the weights of the beam forming vector. Um, and if we have a code book, then uh, you can think of the code book as a fully connected layer with with a few with 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 a number of of hidden nodes basically equal to the number of element of of elements in this code book, or code words in the in this code book. Um, yeah. So again, I mean, the objective here then will be to this, to optimize these um, uh, beam forming weights, which are basically the the, the neural network weights directly and if we optimize them to achieve whatever objectives that we are interested in which is a beam forming gain in this case then we will be optimizing directly the beam forming weights and it's important also to note here that these are uh, complex valued neural networks to to really account for the for the nature of the beam forming weights which are complex uh, so so simply we construct first i mean the first approach here is that we just construct basically a, new, a simple very simple uh, network that just achieves this objective um, so we, we can think of the phase shifter or, or the analog only phase shifter directly as a, as a neural network layer. So essentially this is implemented directly in the hardware and we get the output of the neural network layer, which is again, just a phase shifter. And we do some uh, power computation and uh, max pooling and, uh, and then compare this with, so in this again, first approach we assume that we have the channel and we were able to get the upper bound, which is in this case, equal gain combining. So we have equal gain on all the phase, uh, all the beam forming weights. And with, uh, uh, and applying a mean square uh, error loss function, and we do back propagation to, to predict uh, the weights. But here to, to impose, to make sure that we are imposing also the equal gain uh, constraint or the hardware constraint on the beam forming weights, the neural network weights. So we first, uh, optimize directly angles, and then we compute the cosine and sine basically to construct this neural network weight. So we are we are directly optimizing uh, in this back propagation the the angles, and then this will um, I mean reflect on the on the neural network weights. Okay, so so now if we interesting here if we if we then uh, basically run this iterations over the uh, uh, different set of channels, and we uh, can potentially optimize the beam forming weights just following the kind of again direct implementation of the optimization problem. Uh, and we try to do that. So we we uh, we look at uh, here non line of sight scenario. If we have like a room, this is the green box here is a base station uh, having a sixty four antennas, and this is a user grid. So we position it exactly in this uh, blocked basically location just to examine basically our 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 idea, which is that if we have an online of sight scenario, so maybe in that case, single loop beams may not be optimal and we may uh, be, you know, need to, 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 to learn like a multi-loop beams or uh, something like this. So, so here we, we found that this is actually uh, achievable. So we, uh, so this is essentially the beam, the 64 beam code book learn, learned by this neural network uh, or shallow basically learning kind of architecture. And, uh, and if we pick one of these beams, so this is how it looks like, so it has, two beams, which kind of intuitively expected. Uh, and in terms of um, the performance versus, uh, okay, I need to think, go quickly here. So the, these are the number of beam uh, code box, uh, the dash black line is the upper bound uh, defined by equal gain combining. And this other solid line is the DFT code box. Uh, these are just two different SNRs. And this is a code book of 64 beams. And what we show here essentially is that let's say with 16 uh, beams, 
uh, code book, so we can even overcome the uh, or 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 achieve more beamforming gain compared to the uh, the DFT code book that has 64 beams, and this is just because we made made it more um, uh, basically matching to the or, or better, achieve better matching to the to the environment. Uh, the other case here is uh, this is a line of sight. So again, we're able to just show that we can also learn the beams, um, uh, um, self basically are clear and self learn and optimize the beams to to focus on where the users are. So here we have just users in this direction. Uh, I just move quickly here and and then, uh, but then the, the the limitation in this previous architecture is that we uh, need to have a channel basically. Uh, instead, we need to, to to have the channel and to to to, uh, to obtain the labels which are our equal gain combining basically upper bound in this case. Uh, so can we relax that? So in in this architecture, we try to um, basically relax this this condition or this uh, requirement um, and avoid, I would say, explicitly estimate estimating the channel. So here we have a self-supervised learning architecture where we, uh, we we get the output of the RF chains and again, which is uh, the, the, the output of the, let's say, the virtual complex value near network. And we try to uh, use the, the current code book to, to, to construct uh, um, some version of the channel. I mean, it could, may not be like a, 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 um, basically a good estimation of the channel. And then we use this in the training. So it's kind of, we are jointly optimizing the channel estimation and learning the beams. So without without explicitly doing that, let's say in two stages where we first estimate the channel and then we learn the beam. And then as the, as the beam forming uh, code book actually gets optimized. So this implicitly also improves the channel estimation and this implicitly again optimizes the beam. So it's kind of self learning this, this operation. So here we don't need to store channels. And we don't need to explicitly, I would say, estimate that channel ahead of uh, ahead of time. And this, these are basically the advantages, I say, in the self-supervised learning compared to classical uh, uh, beam forming, let's say, uh, code book designs uh, that were required typically that channel estimation ahead of time. Uh, and it can be uh, the, the interesting thing here also that can can learn arbitrary and unknown array geometry. So we don't have any assumption on the array geometry. And uh, so here, for example, we assume uh, or we consider a uh, phased uh, array with some phase mismatch between the elements. And we try to see like if our learning approach will be able to adapt to this hardware limitations or imperfections. Um, so here we show that this is the dashed lines again the equal being combining uh, upper bound. The blue one is the DFT. And the red one is is our learning approach. So it was different uh, at the phase mismatch. So we still can, can be robust against this phase mismatch. And and essentially the learned beam here, it looks something like this, very like weird beam pattern. But then if we uh, account, if we if we reflect this or project this on the hardware const, uh, mismatches, then we find that it's actually a good beam. So we are we're able basically to learn a beam that matches the hardware uh, mismatch. Okay, so so far I just have two minutes maybe. So so far we um, uh, we still assume that channel as I mean even as a self um, uh, self supervised learning we we still uh, assume that we do some sort of channel estimation which essentially requires time and frequency synchronization. Uh, so can we completely eliminate this channel knowledge requirement um, and essentially develop some sort of non coherent beam learning uh, approach? Uh, so in order to do that, so we, we, we looked at reinforcement learning and looking at the basically just a metric like SNR as a reword, because the SNR doesn't need much kind of synchronization. And then if we can just basically get the RSSI and then or SNR and then use it to as a reword to, to, to guide the, the beam learning. So that will be very interesting. Um, the challenges here is that um, since we have large antenna arrays with, not, with, with, with a few bit phase shifters, so this leads to massive action space and also the SNR doesn't really provide much information about the spatial characteristics of the channel. So let's say we, if the users are, uh, you know, uh, let's say on this side or this side of the base station, so this may give us the same SNR. So we need to also, uh, prov uh, you know, we need to know some spatial characteristics in order to be able to design these beams. So these are the two, two main challenges. Uh, so for this massive uh, subspace, we try to um, so, I mean, we, we designed this uh, neural network, which is 
um, architecture, which is basically, uh, which is based on, on the actor critic uh, uh, neural network approach, but we added this quantizer to account for the phase structures. And, uh, and this, when we define this reward function, that is function of the, uh, of the RSSI or SNR. So essentially this architecture is just learning a beam. So if we have a user at a certain location or a grade of users uh, that are close by, so, so this, this, this architecture will estimate uh, the SNR or just get the SNR and then iteratively optimize the beam to narrow or, or to focus on where the users are or to optimize it in general could be different beam patterns. And the interesting thing here is that this requires only one bit RSSI feedback if, if the user is estimating the SNR or here if, if it's just uplink, we just need basically to estimate the RSSI or SNR. And this doesn't assume any knowledge about the array geometry or the channel structure. And it can generally adapt to hardware impairments or non-ideal hardware. Uh, so we have a lot of results on this in this paper for, for these different cases. Um, now this is beam learning, but then if we have uh, different basically users distributed, so how can we uh, um, uh, learn a codebook? Uh, so this codebook needs an additional layer of clustering. So we basically, we, 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 we try different beams and then we use these beams to construct the feature uh, matrix that, that will tell us some information about the spatial characteristics of the channel, of the users, or the channels of the users. And then we use this, these characteristics or, or these features to cluster the users into groups and then learn a beam for every user. So this is done all like uh, in, in basically end-to-end -end optimization. And yeah, so, so this is some results of, uh, the, of, uh, of the learning, basically uh, uh, this learning approach. So here we consider a line of sight scenario of uh, uh, 32 antennas, 3-bit phase shifters. So here, essentially, we have 8 to the power 32 possible, um, possible basically, beam pattern. And uh, with, with our approach, we try to, uh, this reinforcement learning against this learning uh, over the iterations, so it's 10 to the power uh, 10,000. 10, so if we, uh, if we look at, if we, let's say, look at this with, with 30 or 40, thousand uh, uh, iterations who were able to almost uh, um, predict a beam pattern or learn a beam pattern that is very close to the uh, equal gain combining against this upper bound will not be even uh, cheer with beam pattern. Um, yeah, so so this shows basically the beam pattern across the different uh, iterations. And um, again, this, this can adapt to, to, to beams and uh, to, to situations line of sight, non-line of sight to imperfect arrays. So we also uh, try to implement this, this approach and, and do some sort of real-time beam learning uh, using millimeter wave phased array, 60 gigahertz. So here we have a, a, phase, a phase array uh, with 16 elements at uh, with and a three-bit phase shifter. So we have eight to the power 16 possible beam uh, uh, beam patterns, which is kind of a massive subspace, a massive space of of, of uh, possibilities. But then here, like we're able to show that uh, first, this is the performance of um, uh, of the the SNR or the received power across beams. So if we have 64 beams, so this phased array comes with a built-in calibrated beam codebook of 64 beams, essentially like more like a DFT beams or, or, or a beam steering beams at each to one direction. So this is the best performance we can achieve with this, um, with this beam for like 0.8, whatever uh, scaled uh, to, to some value here to receive power. But then if we, sorry, I will go quickly here. Um, then we try to start running our approach and uh, this, this first, this, this line represents the optimal beam that we can get with um, this classical code book, let's say. And this is our learned, uh, these are the learning over time, it's real time. Uh, and we move a little bit. So eventually, the, this approach was able to learn a beam that achieves better SNR. And then if we, yes, and then if we just change the orientation essentially of the of the array. So now it learned some beam. Now we change the orientation so it the the performance drops, but then or it will it will go back and uh, and calibrate and learn. Uh, Basically, kind of again, self optimize itself to, uh, to, to, for the for the new situation. All right, thank you. So for that, uh, I conclude. Uh, so scale up in MIMO is is essential for six uh, G communication, 
And I talk about sensing and localization, but it's also important. And uh, machine learning is, is a promising tool for uh, millimeter wave and massive MIMO can learn uh, environment and, uh, and, and, um, and location aware uh, channel prediction and, and beam prediction. Uh, we can potentially use a channel at one subspace to or one or one location, one uh, frequency band to predict the channel and beams at a different frequency band. And we can optimize the food box to be environment and hardware uh, aware. And yeah, so it's different interesting work also for the future. Uh, so optimizing the deep learning models, building more proof concept prototypes. And um, yeah, so with that, I conclude. Thank you. And uh, any questions?